Hello and welcome to another installment of Quantum Mechanics, this time a Quantum Mechanics tutorial. I'm not sure what questions we're, gonna, we're going to go through today. I do know that we'll start at exercise 44 and then go through to 45 and 46 and so on until the end of the class. Uh, this is going to be the most boring class of, of, the, uh, of the course, uh, just because it's, it's covering prerequisites, tools that you need to use to do quantum mechanics. Um, I think it's beautiful and interesting, but we'll see what you, what you think collectively. Uh, the point is, this is about developing uh, some of the basic techniques that you need to, um, to do quantum mechanics. Alright, so let's begin with exercise 44. In fact, before we begin with exercise 44, let's have a little bit of revision of some basic things regarding linear operators in quantum mechanics, some things that we're going to be uh, using and uh, needing. So first of all, we had the idea of a Hermitian operator. So where does this come from? In Dirac notation, if you were to have two wave functions, psi1 and psi2, and if I was to give you a particular linear operator A, and I write this down in Dirac notation, if we move this linear operator A to the left, and I put a dagger on it, then by definition, um, for any, for arbitrary wave function psi1 and psi2, for a particular linear operator A, by definition, the Hermitian conjugate operator A dagger is the operator that makes this true. Now if um, an operator equals its Hermitian conjugate, then we speak of it as being a uh, Hermitian. The Dirac notation, I'll remind you, if you have the Dirac notation of, let's say, a horizontal squiggle with a vertical squiggle, uh, this is equivalent to integrating over all space. The first slot, whatever's in there, you star it. The second slot, whatever's in there, you leave it alone, and you integrate it over all space. And I'll leave off the dx, dy, dz. So this is what we mean by uh, the essence of, of Dirac notation. Uh, we'll use this repeatedly. The last thing that I want to mention is a unitary operator. So if uh, an operator, um, if its dagger equals its inverse, then we'd speak of that operator as being unitary. <coughs> One further thing, we learned about changes of representation. So one further piece of revision regarding changes of representation. Uh, we have two representations of quantum physics. In one representation, we would have wave functions psi and operators such as A and B, linear operators. In a different representation, we would call our wave functions, um, let's say, psi hat, and our operators would also change, A hat, B hat, etc. The question is, how do you change representation? We learned how to use unitary operators to change representation. We saw, for example, that um, the new representation of the wave function is obtained by taking the old representation of the wave function and acting on it with a unitary operator. We also learned uh, how operators uh, transform. And I'll just remind you that the operators such as uh, A hat, B hat, etc., cetera, um, transform in the following way. So these are the pieces of revision regarding linear operators in the context of quantum mechanics that we need uh, for the class today. And our understanding of these will be deepened through these exercises. So let's begin with exercise 44. So here we need to, make, to prove two things. Uh, you're given two linear operators, A and B. Uh, you're also going to be given a complex number C. So two arbitrary linear operators, uh, A and B, together with a complex number C. And we need to prove two things. The first of which is that if you take uh, the complex number C, multiply by this operator, this linear operator, and then you Hermitian conjugate the product, then you'll end up with a complex conjugate of C times a Hermitian conjugate of A. So this is the first of two things that we want to prove as part of this exercise. In terms of a, a starting point, uh, there are many, many ways to do every exercise and as, as always, as a challenge to you, uh, we'll do it one particular way. Uh, my challenge to you will be to solve this uh, three different ways. 
next time you're on the train or walking from A to B, think about how you can solve these problems differently. Better still, how can you solve it more elegantly, more swiftly or more physically transparently than the solutions we give? All right, let, let's begin with um, Hermitian operators. Hermitian operators equal their own dagger. But if we're talking about arbitrary linear operators, a picture we can have here, which um, this is the frog analogy, and I didn't practice this, I probably should have. This is the frog analogy. We can think of this operator uh, when it hops from the right-hand side to the left-hand side of the Dirac bracket, it picks up a dagger. Yep. So the frog hops. If it's on the right-hand side, uh, it'll pick up a dagger in going uh, from right to left. That also happens if you, if you hop from left to right. If this had a dagger, then you'd have a double dagger here, but double dagger is no dagger. Uh, you might want to prove this to yourself. Double dagger uh, is no dagger. So just think of the frogs, and we're going to be making use of this um, operator hopping technique um, a couple of times. So let's begin with our definition of a Hermitian operator, precisely what I've written there. Yep. Oh, sorry, our definition of, of a um, Hermitian conjugate operator. Again, the frog A has hopped from the right uh, to the left, picking up a dagger in the process. Now what I'm going to do is to multiply both sides by C star. Now I've just pulled that out of the air, right? Let's multiply both sides by C star. Um, what possible, and this is the context here is trial and error, what possible logic could make me want to pre-multiply both sides by C star. Why am I doing this? How does it help me solve the problem? Let me ask a slightly softer question. How might it help me so solve the problem? And again, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. That's the spirit of trial and error. And most surgery problems are not just things you work out. You need to try several approaches. Why is this a sensible thing to try? Beautiful. It, it's that simple. The answer has a coefficient of C star. The original equation didn't. Now there's Hermitian conjugates going around, so I'm going to try um, the definition of Hermitian conjugation and write that down. But then, you know, we, we need to be brutally, coldly logical here. There is a C star here, therefore I need a C star in my equation. So I put it there, right? And so I put it there, bang, bang. Uh, so that's you know, from one perspective, it's, that's not clean logic, but I need a C star, so I'll put it there. Then I need to massage it to try and get the result I want. That's absolutely classic uh, trial and error logic. In that vein of what do I do next or what could I try next, because I, I don't know what to do next, uh, what could I try next? So let's stare at this until the answer comes to us. So I'm staring at this at each term. Any answers popping to your head? Beautiful. We want to group the C's and the A's together. Here we have a C uh, grouped with an A. We don't have C's grouped with A's. Let's try uh, grouping a C with an A together. Now I want to think in terms of um, of Dirac uh, brackets. This equation I'm going to circle in purple. Okay, that's topologically equivalent to a circle. Um, so I've circled this in purple. Uh, the point is that whatever's in the first slot is starred. Yep. Whatever's in the first slot is starred. So if I was to absorb, we want to group C's and A's together. If I want to absorb this C into the first slot, because I want to group the C's and the A's, and I want to absorb this C into the second slot. I want to group the C's and A's. I need to be careful because this first slot is complex conjugated, but the second slot isn't. So as far as the left-hand side is concerned, precisely because of the complex conjugation that appears here, when this C star is absorbed into the first slot, it loses its star. Uh, 
Um, no, so, so, the question is, is C um, an operator as well? Uh, no, it's not. It's a complex constant. So here, C is, is, is a complex constant. A and B are operators, but C is a complex constant. So we've absorbed this complex constant into here um, and lose the star in the process. This C star being absorbed into the right-hand slot, we want to group C's and A's together. Uh, the right-hand slot, it doesn't lose its star. Um, what do I do next? So I'm staring at, the, at what I want to prove, that the Hermitian conjugate of CA is the same thing as uh, C star, A star. I note that what's in these two bubbles must be Hermitian conjugates of each other. Yep. Whatever this is, when it hops to the left, um, um, whatever this is, uh, when it hops to the left, it's going to pick up uh, a, a dagger. Yep, it's going to pick up um, a dagger. Any thoughts on how to proceed? So I'm staring at this, uh, and I'm staring at this, and I'm making the point that whatever's in this bubble, this could be the operator A, in which case this is A dagger by definition. This could be the operator A, B, C, D dagger, C triple dagger, F squared. You'll just write all those things out again and put them there and then put a dagger around the whole lot. Yep. So this um, object here and this object here are related by Hermitian uh, conjugation. Yep. This dagger equals this, just to repeat. This, what I've circled in purple, dagger equals this. So we look at um, uh, what we have here. The Hermitian conjugate of this object is this. Yep. Just to repeat, the Hermitian conjugate of this, the Hermitian conjugate of that, equals what's in this left slot. And that's almost what I wanted to prove. If the C became a C star and the C star became a C, then I would have proven what I wanted to prove. How can I just stare at this? You know, what I want is this result. How can I just stare at this and with one, one sentence of plain English justification turn this into this? Uh, take the Hermitian conjugate of both sides. Uh, this is an excellent answer. Um, so, so let's do it. Let's take the Hermitian conjugate of both sides. So we take the Hermitian conjugate of the left hand side. We take the Hermitian conjugate of the right hand side. Um, uh, what do I do next? So we cancel out uh, the double daggers. Um, C A daggered uh, equals C star A dagger. So we need to interchange the A's and the A daggers now. Um, so the statement is that A is Hermitian. We're not assuming that A is Hermitian. Uh, this is definitely good logic. Um, we're one step away from the answer. A is an arbitrary linear operator. Using A, you could define an A dagger. We could give the operator A dagger a name. We could call it B. Yep. So I can just replace A dagger with B. So this A dagger would become a B. A, well, what's A? Well, let's permission conjugate both sides. A becomes B dagger. The point I'm making here 
is that uh, there's arbitrariness in the operators A, so you can call them whatever you want. Now this is a result you want to prove, except for B rather than A, but that's immaterial. The point is that we can uh, make use of, of an arbitrariness that we began with. Another th way that we could have gotten the answer we wanted was to say, well, C is an arbitrary complex number. C star is an comp arbitrary complex number as well, complex conjugated. Let's just call the complex number little c star, let's call it big C, in which case big C star um, equals uh, big C star equals uh, C, yep. So you can just basically hop the star from this C to this C, precisely because C is an arbitrary complex number, you just rename little c as big C star, uh, and this star would automatically hop here. Uh, whichever logic you use, you end up with the required result, which is good. I also want to emphasise, actually I shouldn't have said this is boring, this is fun linear algebra, um, but that comment makes the point that nothing that we're doing today is peculiar to quantum mechanics. Uh, these are all results of, um, of, of the underlying uh, mathematics, which is, has infinitely broader applicability uh, than uh, just quantum physics. And again, from a pure mathematics perspective, you don't even need to apply this mathematics if you, if you choose not to. Uh, and it's still beautiful. All right, we want the second part of this exercise, which is to prove that if you have a product of operators, a product of linear operators, and we Hermitian conjugate this product, we want to prove that that equals the product of the Hermitian conjugates, but with order reversed. So this is what we want to prove. Hermitian conjugation of, of operators, um, A, B, all daggered, gives you the product of the Hermitian conjugates, but with order uh, reversed. So just as a starting point, let's consider um, this object here. Let's consider this object here. Now when I circle this, or better still, I could just put it in round brackets. When I circle this, I'm going to consider this to be one object. This is one object upon which the operator B dagger acts. And again, I want you to remember the frog. This is one object on which B dagger acts. You take psi 2, it's acted upon by A dagger to give a new function, which is what's circled, and that new function is acted upon by B dagger. But now we do our Hermitian frog hopping. Um, when the frog hops, it becomes Hermitian conjugated. So when the B dagger hops to the left, it becomes Hermitian conjugated, picks up the double dagger. So this is good. The frog has hopped once, as was previously pointed out. Double dagger is uh, no dagger at all. What would be a good next step? Do it again, excellent, I like it. Um, let's do it again. This is an object upon which the operator A dagger acts. Um, this is an object in the left hand slot. It's what you get when B acts upon psi one. So A hops to the left, picking up a double dagger, which is no dagger at all, and this acts on the object B psi one. Now I can drop the circling because uh, it's understood that operators act from right to left without needing brackets or circles. Psi one is acted upon by B, it slams into it to give a new function or object, B psi one, upon which A acts. Yep. The A is hopped away, we have this. So let me do some more circling with some white chalk. This object and um, this object, um, one is the dagger of the other. Yep. One is the dagger of the other. Uh, remember the frog. Yep. One is the dagger of the other. One is the dagger of the other. This uh, makes us happy because it's what we wanted to prove. Again, the idea is uh, take a 
product operators, permission conjugated. Uh, then you'll end up with a product of the permission conjugates with order uh, reversed. As always, I challenge you to work this out more swiftly, more elegantly, more compactly, more mathematically transparently, and more physically transparently. So I want to move on to exercise 45. And this is regarding the concept of completeness, the mathematical concept of completeness. Again, we look at our brick wall. Yeah? I, want, I would speak of a set of bricks as complete, and I'm being loose here. I would speak of a set of bricks as complete if I can build anything out of them. I'd set a, speak of the set of um, non-negative powers of x, namely 1, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, etc., as a complete set, because, because I can build arbitrary functions, uh, f of x, out of the weight of superposition of um, our powers of x, that's a Taylor series. Now I could be more precise about the notion of completeness. If I have the set of powers of x, just as, as an example, the so set, set of powers of x, where m is naught, one, two, three, etc., uh, I can build an arbitrary function f of x uh, as a Taylor series. What's a Taylor series? Well, we'll be summing over some integers m, which go from naught to uh, some maximum value. We'd have some coefficients, which I'd call f subscript m, and we'd have our powers of x. And when we speak of completeness, what we mean is the following, more, more precisely. This is a mathematician in me speaking. Um, you make m some integer, some positive integer, uh, and as you make m arbitrarily large, the difference between this object and the thing on the left will become vanishingly small uh, under some suitable measure of what you mean by a vanishingly small error under a suitable norm. In other words, the right-hand side will converge to the left-hand side if capital M is big. Uh, this is what we mean more precisely by, by completeness. I just want to loosely summarise that as you can build arbitrary functions by weighted superpositions of your complete set. And you know of many complete sets, the sets of powers of x, as far as uh, one-dimensional Taylor series are concerned, the set of functions e to the i m x, where m is an integer, if you're talking about Fourier series, uh, eigenfunction expansions, uh, we have another complete set there, um, the Fourier integral, the plane waves in equation 15, when you're summing up plane waves to make arbitrary functions. In all those cases, you're building up arbitrary objects out of sums of complete functions. Another, th let me give you one final example of um, the meaning of completeness. Suppose we have a two-dimensional world. We have a two-dimensional world, and I give you two orthogonal unit vectors, x hat and y hat. This is a complete set, because you give me any vector, v, and you can express it as a superposition of uh, x hat and y hat. The point is that um, any two-dimensional vector can be written uh, precisely as a superposition of these um, uh, two basis vectors in the so-called complete set. Now I've pointed out a geometric analogy between, let's say, the set of powers of x as a complete set for functions f of x uh, and a set of x hat y hat as a complete set for the vectors v. At this point you should be asking yourself the following question. Uh, I've given you this analogy yet again between vectors and functions. Uh, I want some criticism now. What's a difference between uh, this complete set, this is a complete set um, in which any arbitrary vector in 2D can be expressed uh, precisely. What's the difference between this complete set and this complete set? I want to nuance the fact that there is a difference. Vectors and functions are different, or 2D vectors and functions are different. What's the, what's the difference between the two? Okay, a vector is not a function. <laughs> Um, there's one difference. Uh, what's the second difference? Let me ask a leading question. How many elements are there in this set, this complete set? Two. How many elements are there here? 
are infinite. Yep. So here we've got infinite dimensional spaces. Here we have finite dimensional spaces. And there's quite a lot of, um, this is why I needed this subtlety. Uh, these sums converge to the function as m tends to infinity. I don't need to pull any of those tricks uh, here. Uh, the fact that we have, yep. so this is one thing. A second point is, uh, uh, here we need the notion of an error. This thing is converging to this as n tends to infinity, again with some suitable norm. But I want, the reason I'm doing this is one, to have you think about Fourier series, Taylor series, um, whatever other series you work with, uh, vectors, Functions, eigenfunction expansions, Fourier transforms can all be viewed from um, one unified perspective. There's details of differences of detail, of course, but uh, I just wanted to stitch the commonality here. How do we know? And this is, by the way, the preface to the question. I haven't forgotten the question, um, even though I haven't written it down yet. Uh, just by way of preface to the question, I ask you: How do you know that a set is complete? And the answer is that you, um, what are we doing here on this right hand side? What we're doing is we're taking an arbitrary vector V. We have our X and our Y coordinate system along which the unit vectors point. We project onto the X axis and this gives us a number which is VX, precisely this coefficient here. Then we project onto the Y axis Yep, but let me write it there. We project onto the y-axis and that has a length vy, which is this coefficient here. Now this is superficial and profound, right? This equals this plus this. Let me just repeat. This equals this plus this. And it, whichever vector you had, because your set is complete, you always end up with the vector that you started out with when you um, project it onto each of the basis vectors of your complete set, you end up with the uh, vector back again. That idea generalizes to infinite dimensional spaces. When we're talking about eigenfunction expansions, object, wave function, object, function, um, sum, coefficients fm, coefficients cm, probability amplitudes, Complete set, x to the m, complete set of eigenfunctions. When we do the eigenfunction expansion, uh, we're doing something precisely analogous to this from a geometric perspective. But we ask the question, how do I know that the set is complete? You know, this is trivial, right? You're staring at me thinking, why am I banging on about this trivial stuff? Uh, any vector can be made out of, any 2D vector can be expressed as a sum of a weighted superposition of x hat and y hat. But I ask you the question, how do I know that? So how do we know that? Let me take this very elementary expression and write it out again. Now, as I was emphasizing, this is the projection of the vector v onto the um, x hat unit vector. Similarly for Vy, order doesn't matter here. All right. Let me pull the V out the, the back. Order doesn't matter here, these are just numbers and vectors. Here we have an x hat. Here we have x hat dot. Yep, that's an operator which acts on V, x dot, hat dot with V. Similarly, for this, y hat, y hat dot. And this is v, right? That's v. And this is v. Therefore, this is 1. Yep. v equals v. This is 1. That's just a mathematization of the fact that this equals this plus this. If you project onto your first element of your basis, and you multiply through by your basis vector, you project onto the second, multiply by your basis vector, etc. cetera, uh, do all that, and you'll end up with the same vector back again. Yep. So look at that from this perspective, we can now um, begin to understand what the question means, uh, question, exercise 45. 
I can find it. Context here is not expressing uh, vectors as sums of x hats and y hats. The context here, rather, is the eigenfunction expansion. And it's asking the question, how do you know that your set of eigenfunctions, psi n, is complete? And the answer is, because this equals 1, right, but we need to be more precise, the answer is the so-called closure relation. This is also called the completeness relation because it demonstrates the completeness of a set of functions in this, in this sense, in this case, a set of eigenfunctions. So take one of your eigenfunctions, psi n, which will be a function of position. Write it down twice. Star the first one and put a prime coordinate here. Now at this point, I'm getting lost. I don't know what the hell's going on physically. That's fine. We're going to prove this and understand it. Sum over all the ends. So it's quite a peculiar object. You pick two points in space, you form this product, uh, you add them all up and you get zero or infinity depending on whether or not r equals r prime. When you look up a mathematics book or a quantum mechanics book, they'll just blandly state that this is a statement of, of completeness. If your set of eigenfunctions gives you this, then you have a complete set and if it doesn't, then you don't. Now the one uh, has become a Dirac delta but we want to understand, we want to do two things. First of all, we want to prove this. And secondly, we want to understand why um, the, the fact that a set of eigenfunctions obeys this implies that the set, said set of eigenfunctions is complete. So let's, let's begin by proving it, which is what the question actually asks. And the proof is actually disappointingly swift. And when I say disappointingly swift, you just work it out in a few lines then you stare at it and you think, well, I've proved it, but what the hell does it mean? Uh, so we're going to prove it quickly, and then we're going to ask the question, the deeper question, uh, what does it mean? So I'm going to begin with the eigenfunction expansion. So summing over integers n, we're going to have some eigenfunctions, psi n, and then coefficients, cm, and those coefficients, cm, in analogy with the vectors, is just the projection of the vector slash function onto the element of the basis. This is just a, a, um, for functions, what, what dot product is to vectors. So this is our eigenfunction expansion, where these are the coefficients cm. We then ask the question, what could I do next? Notice the wording, what could I do next? There's very little I could do next. What could I do next? I'll give you a hint. I can only think of one thing to do next. Beautiful. Swap the Dirac bracket for an integral. Make use of the definition of, of a bracket, Dirac bracket. Yep. So the first object is starred. Now I need to be a bit careful. Um, this is going to be a function of r. Psi is a function of r. Now there might be a, a t coming along for the ride here. I'm just ignoring t dependence. It makes no difference. So I've written out the Dirac bracket uh, explicitly. What have I done wrong? It's almost right, but not quite. I stuffed up something. What is it? Uh, yes. We've integrated over R. This object here is a number. It's independent of R. R is a, very, a dummy variable of integration. But once we do this integral, once you do this integral, there is no r left. It's being integrated over. It's gone. It doesn't exist. This r is a fed income r. This is a real r. This does exist. I need to distinguish between the two r's. The dummy variable r, I'm going to call r prime, which is integrated over. It's gone. And I don't want to confuse it with the free variable r. So here, r prime is a dummy variable. 
and r is uh, a free variable. Again, in the spirit of there's very, very little that I can do, one of the very, very few things that I can do now is to interchange the order of summation and integration. Or stated slightly differently, I want to interchange the order of discrete sum and continuous sum. You know, this is S for sigma, S for sum, S for discrete sum. This is S for sum, except a continuous sum, which is what an integral is. So let's interchange the order of integration and summation. So we have our, our triple integral. And we're integrating over R prime. Yep. Uh, when I shove uh, the sum in, everything that, that has an n subscript is going to go to the right of the sum. Everything else will go to the left of the sum. So psi n star of r prime is going to go here because it has uh, an, n, an n in it. Psi of r prime has no n, hence it comes out the front. Uh, the r prime has already been taken care of, and psi n of r goes here because it has an n subscript. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm staring at this object. I'm just going to remove these square brackets because I just had them there as a mental crutch. And I want to write this psi explicitly. So we're staring at this equation. So here, psi of r is a particular but otherwise arbitrary function. And here we have an integral involving that same function. Now remember the sifting property, the Dirac delta. Any integral involving the Dirac delta is trivial. Throw away the integral sign, throw away the Dirac delta. Uh, what's left, you then just replace um, the arguments with the value that makes the argument of the Dirac delta vanish. What I want to do here is to use the sifting property of the Dirac delta in reverse. Yep, sometimes rules get used backwards. Um, this is an integral with an arbitrary uh, particular function psi. This is a given set whose completeness we wish, we wish to, to, to um, uh, test. This integral must always be this thing, therefore this must be the Dirac delta um, in the sense given here. Again, this is a mathematical aside. Uh, what I just said is strictly not true. Uh, we could add what's called, for those of you doing measure theory, we could add a set of measure zero to this object and it wouldn't change. Um, we only need this to behave the same as a Dirac delta under an integral. Uh, that's an exotic caveat for the perspective of this course. The point here is using the Dirac delta sifting property in reverse, this object must equal the Dirac delta, which is precisely uh, what we wanted to prove. Now, I feel disappointed because in three lines of mathematics, we've proven this result. That if your set of functions, um, uh, psi n, obeys this, then it's complete. But how is that, the physical meaning of this, evident from the equations on the board, because no book will tell you this, and it used to drive me nuts. Staring at this bottom board, how does that, I know that my question is deliberately vague, um, explain to me how that bunch of symbols expresses completeness. I'm looking for a simple answer that no book will give you. It's arbitrary. Um, can you elaborate? So you can choose any function you want, and that relation stays true. So it's arbitrary. You can choose uh, any function you want, and this relation will be true. Any function you want, as in this being any function you want. This is good. This is all good. Would someone like to add to that? Cool. Did you know that the mean time between um, a lecturer asking for um, the answer to a question and answering the question themselves is 0.7 of a second? Uh, I didn't believe this, but it's actually true. I'm going to tease you and just actually leave you with that. Your answer was the essence of it, but I want you to think more deeply about this. I want you to write this down and stare at it. 
until um, it becomes self-evident that this is an expression of completeness, or more precisely, that this uh, is an expression of completeness. How will you know when you understand it? You'll know that you understand it when you can just write it down on inspection, right? Now, I'm not being arrogant here. If you understand something sufficiently deeply, uh, it should be obvious. That's almost a tautology. If you understand it deeply enough, it should become simple. If it's not simple in your brain, then keep thinking about it until it becomes simple. The essence to dealing with complexity, in my view, in any technical setting, uh, is to stare at the problem, to think about it, discuss it, argue it, look at it from different angles, until um, it, it becomes simple. So we've just finished exercise 45, so let's move on to 46. And I just want to do the last part of exercise 46. And this was a result. I was wrong, by the way, when I said this, um, this, this, this uh, tute would be boring, uh, because we're about to have one of the most profound results in the course. So exercise 46, uh, D. The question here is, you have two representations of quantum physics related, as before, via a unitary transformation. In the first representation, you would have, or you could have, linear operators A and B. In the new representation, you would call them A hat uh, and B hat. And this is two uh, of infinitely many different ways of doing quantum physics. Yep. You might have another unitary transformation, I don't know, U tilde, which gives you yet another representation. Uh, you could have infinitely many possible representations. Yep. And they're all related by unitary operators. There's infinitely many of these things. So infinitely many ways of doing quantum physics, fantastic. You then have one particular way of doing quantum physics, and as you do, you calculate a commutator. You have the commutator of the linear operator A and B, uh, giving some complex number C, some complex constant C. Now, we know that if you change representation, you use a unitary operator to do so, and you'll change the representation of your wave functions. Your wave functions psi will become psi hat. Your operators A, B, etc., will become A hat, B hat, etc. And we know how both the size transform old representation new. You just apply the unitary operator to it. Uh, the operators themselves transform in a slightly more complicated way. The question is, what happens to the commutation relations? And the question is to show that when you make a change of representation, your operator A will become A hat. Your operator B will become B hat. And your complex number C will be unchanged. Now, this is boring, but it's also profound. It's profound. Um, well, let me ask the question, why is this profound? This is what we want to prove, that commutation relations are unchanged when you change from one representation to another. Why is that profound? We do physics, right? We study the physical world. Uh, this vector exists independently of how we choose to coordinatize it. If I have I could, a particular x, y, z coordinate system, I could describe this physical object in terms of this x, y, z coordinate system. And you would have a particular x, y, and z projection. You go to a different coordinate system, you would have a different x, y, and z projection. Again, the point is there's infinitely many ways of describing the physical world, but this vector exists independently of how you choose to coordinatize it. When, so I would call this a geometric object. It's a physical object existing independently of us. This is telling us something very profound because it says that in any one of the infinitely many different ways of doing quantum physics, in fact in any pair, right, this is one way of doing quantum, this is another, related by a, a certain unitary transformation, 
The commutation relations are the same in every representation. Hence, the commutation relations tell you something. I'm using the word geometric here loosely. Um, uh, the commutation relations are telling you something which is, in, or which is independent of representation uh, in, in a similar way to the physical world existing independently of how we choose to coordinateize it. So there's something deeply geometric or um, representation free about commutators. And this is why, for example, many books on very advanced quantum mechanics and supersymmetry begin with uh, commutation relations because they're independent of representation. And with all that um, preamble, the proof is going to be um, almost disappointingly swift. So let's do it. Um, I want to calculate this commutator on the right hand side. It'll be the first operator times the second minus the second times the first. And, and this equals C. So you could show that this implies this or conversely. Um, I'm going to go backwards just for the hell of it. Uh, A hat is U A U dagger. B hat is U A U B U dagger. Similarly for the B hat uh, and the A hat. And that'll equal, equal C. Um, what do I do next? Here's a hint. I uh, cancel them out that um, unitary operators equal their own inverse. So u dagger u is the unit operator. So the u dagger u is gone. We're left with u a b u dagger, which I'll write as follows. Minus u b a u dagger, u b a u dagger equaling c. Now what's in the middle is a commutator, which is AB um, minus BA, the commutator of uh, A with B. So we have U, commutator of A with B, uh, U dagger, equaling C. Now I'm running out of time. Uh, to finish this, I would pre-multiply by U dagger, post-multiply by U, uh, and the results will pop out. I'll leave that final piece of the logic to you. Just let me repeat. You'd pre-multiply by u dagger, post-multiply by u, um, and the result to be derived would pop out. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you.